One of the most profound concepts in sedimentology and stratigraphy is the observation that sedimentary rocks can be used to reconstruct changes that occurred in ancient environments over time. One of the most important causes of environmental change is the natural rise and fall of sea level. These sea level changes leave their mark on sediment and sedimentary rock layers. We can observe the consequences of sea level changes in the facies of the sedimentary layers. Because the facies of a sedimentary layer depends on the water depth in its depositional environment, stratigraphic patterns and facies can help us to identify past sea level changes. Specifically, if sea level was rising or falling at a certain place in the past. We can also use an understanding of how sea level change is recorded in sedimentary rocks to help us to do relative dating and stratigraphic correlation. The field of geology dedicated to the relationship between sedimentation and sea level is called sequence stratigraphy. This branch of stratigraphy is focused on the identification and correlation of sequences of strata with the fingerprints of cyclical changes in sea level. Rather than correlating rocks according to lithology or fossils, the stratigrapher attempts to correlate sequences that were deposited during the same episodes of sea level rise and fall. Each sequence consists of multiple packages of strata called systems tracks. The three systems tracks are the low stand, transgressive, and high stand. Each system track, in turn, consists of multiple packages of strata called parasequences. Each systems track represents a time in the cycle of sea level change, and the parasequences represent minor fluctuations in sea level during those times. In any case, the boundaries between the sequences, systems tracks, and parasequences are flooding surfaces, marking changes in facies from shallow to deep. In order to recognize systems tracks and define sequences, one must understand the relationship between sediment supply and accommodation space. In all basins, including the ocean basin, the deposition of sedimentary layers is controlled by two factors, the supply of sediment from sources outside the basin and the amount of space available for accommodating sediment that might end up being deposited there. In the ocean, the main control on accommodation space is sea level. As sea level rises, so does the amount of accommodation space. As sea level falls, the amount of accommodation space decreases. With this in mind, we can think about the changes and facies caused by sea level fluctuations in terms of changes in sediment supply and accommodation space. If sea level rises, the amount of accommodation space begins to grow faster than the supply of sediment. The facies deepen upward through sedimentary logs and sections. There is deepening of facies up section in a stratigraphic column. We refer to this pattern of facies change as retrogradation. Conversely, if sea level falls or remains constant with a steady supply of sediment, then no new accommodation space is created and the existing accommodation space fills up with sediment over time. The sedimentary layers build up and out toward the sea over time. As a result, facies appear to shallow up section in a sedimentary log. We refer to this shallowing upward facies change as progradation. Under certain conditions, the sediment supply rate 
is balanced by the creation of accommodation space. These somewhat rare circumstances result in sedimentary logs and stratigraphic columns that neither shallow or deepen up section. We refer to this sort of facies succession as aggradation. Overall, with an understanding of progradation, retrogradation, and aggradation, we can return to the topic of sequences. Sequences are bounded by unconformities called sequence boundaries. The lower sequence boundary is created by a fall in sea level, resulting in a marine regression. In the process, the fall in sea level creates an unconformity where environments that were previously submerged underwater are now exposed to the air. Erosion of this new aerial environment can create an erosional surface that can be recognized over large distances. In any case, the unconformity can be correlated to a correlative conformity located in deep water. The correlative conformity can sometimes be recognized by a submarine fan composed of turbidites of sediment derived from detritus from the hinterland and erosion of the sediment on the shelf along the erosional surface. In any case, the unconformity and correlative conformity together represent the sequence boundary. The sedimentary layers deposited on top of the sequence boundary when sea level is low are collectively called the low stand systems tract. During this systems tract, sea level is rising, but slowly, and the erosion of the shelf is providing a large supply of sediment to the basin. This sediment builds up as a basin floor fan made of turbidites that progrades out toward the sea. The facies shallow upward through the sequence. Eventually, the rate of accommodation space creation becomes greater than the supply of sediment. At this point, the package of layers are deposited on a transgressive surface and called the transgressive systems track. These layers have a retrogradational pattern. The facies deepen upward as the coastline begins to move back toward land. Over time, the rate of sea level rise slows down because accommodation space is getting filled by sediment. At this point, the sedimentary layers are getting deposited on top of a maximum flooding surface, which marks the deepest water facies as well as the furthest landward extent of the shoreline. Again, the sediment supply outpaces the creation of accommodation space. So the facies shallow upward and prograde out toward the open sea. We refer to these strata as the high stand systems track. The last step that creates a sequence is sea level fall. This forced regression ends the cycle of sea level change. The fall in sea level creates another unconformity which again may develop into an erosional surface in the shallow water. In any case, this unconformity is another sequence boundary. It defines the top of this particular sequence as well as the bottom of the sequence that will be deposited on top of it. Altogether, the facies of the sequence provide a fingerprint for recognizing a past episode of marine transgression. It is assumed in particular that the unconformities and flooding surfaces represent moments in time that can be correlated across large distances among stratigraphic sections. In sequence stratigraphy, we can use these surfaces to understand the three-dimensional relationship and relative ages of strata 
and reconstruct Earth history. Indeed, sequence stratigraphy has emerged as one of the most powerful and popular approaches to stratigraphy today. For this reason, it is often favored by many geologists working in the hydrocarbon and petroleum industries. As we wrap up our look at sequence stratigraphy, I would like to leave you with a few parting ideas. The biggest advantage of sequence stratigraphy over other approaches is that it allows for the correlation of rocks across facies and environments of various types. It opens up the possibility of correlating rocks between shallow and deep water environments, between terrigenous shelves and carbonate platforms, between terrigenous rocks and limestones. But we've barely scratched the surface. The first step toward actually doing sequence stratigraphy is simply learning the vocabulary. One must develop an understanding of how sea level change affects accommodation space and stratigraphic patterns, and how facies are distributed in three dimensions throughout sequences. Moving forward, the real challenge in sequence stratigraphy is learning to identify the facies of the sedimentary packages to the point where you can actually predict how they are distributed in three dimensions. Always remember, in sequence stratigraphy, rocks of two different facies can be correlated with each other because they were deposited at the same time in different environments. And the systems tracks and pair sequences are not two-dimensional. They are bodies of rock spread out across three dimensions. One must consider spatially how these facies are distributed across large regions. Suffice it to say that although sequence stratigraphy has a huge upside, it can be exceedingly challenging to use it at times. As a rule of thumb, it is generally advisable to attempt other approaches like lithostratigraphy, biostratigraphy, or chemostratigraphy before exploring sequence stratigraphy. It may well end up being the only option in the end, but in an ideal world, all of your work in stratigraphic correlation, regardless of what approach you take, should lead you to the same conclusions.